Tonight is a tricky subject and I'm almost nervous to approach it. But we are going to power through and it's going to get worse before it gets better. So we might as well just dive in and say some of the things that the book of Revelation says. You know, we are always so scared to say what the book of Revelation says, but then on the other hand, I am personally very grateful that it does say these things. Because I myself have been trapped in many of these deceptions. And I'm so grateful to God for having said these things so that we can make decisions to sever the ties that bind us to all these strange winds of doctrine, which we take so for granted because we don't know anything else. The simplicity of knowing Jesus Christ and Him crucified escapes many of us. And if only we knew what a friend we have and how approachable He is and how easy it is to be in contact with Him, we would save ourselves many a tear and many a trouble. Well, who is this beast from the bottomless pit and where do we read about it? Well, we finished last night up to the end of chapter 9. Now, logically, we should go into chapter 10, but I will reserve chapter 10 for a little bit later because there are two sides to a story. The one is the apostasy as it grows, and we started that last night, and we show how, showed how spiritual darkness increased on this earth and how a star fell from heaven and smoke started coming out of the bottomless pit. That means satanic teachings were starting to emanate and take control of the earth. Tonight we're going to go a little bit further and we'll see what eventually is the culmination of these things that come from the bottomless pit and it will develop into a beast that comes from the bottomless pit. Now what is a beast? Well again we have to ask the Bible. And in Daniel chapter 7, a beast is very clearly defined as a king of a king or a kingdom. It's a kingdom. So here is a political entity that is manifesting itself. So in other words, the false teaching have become so widespread that they have infiltrated into a political system and have become world doctrine, if you like. That's scary. Legislated world doctrine. In its fullness, we had not seen it at this stage when it appears, but it will grow into a worldwide phenomenon. And that's the scary bit. And the question is, who's behind it all? And that question we also want to answer tonight. Revelation chapter 11. We're skipping 10 because that's the counterpart. And we'll be dealing with that a little bit later. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God. You know, when you measure something, you're seeing whether it measures up. Isn't that so? The Bible says we are the temple of the living God. So, do we measure up? Measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. So, just like we had a numbering, so now we have a measuring. But the court which is without, the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city, they shall tread underfoot. They will trample upon the truth of God and upon the salvation in Christ, which is typified in the sanctuary. Everything in the sanctuary is typical of Christ. The door, the gateway where you came in, is a representative of Christ the door. The altar of burnt offering is a representation of the cross, the lamb that was slain. Behold the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. The labor that washes, he is the one that washes away our sins. You must be born by water and the Spirit. 
you go into the first chamber, Jesus is the light of the world, Jesus is the bread of the presence, Jesus is the bread from heaven. He is the incense that makes us acceptable through his merit to God. If you go into the final chamber, he's the lawgiver. He shields us from the condemnation of the law through his mercy. Wow, everything's there in the sanctuary. It's a beautiful message. So here is the story of salvation in Christ, which will be trampled under by certain Gentile forces. And this will be done for 40 and 2 months. Now that's a prophetic time again. And uh, it would be interesting to know what this entails. And of course it is a quote from the book of Daniel chapter 7 where all the attributes of the Antichrist are given, including the fact that he reigns for this period. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy, that is, preach, a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloths. Now, that's what we call Hebrew parallelism. You say something in one way and you repeat it in another way. So the first 42 months is followed by 1,260 days. And in prophetic terms, they're the same period. 42 prophetic months, a prophetic month had 30 days. 42 times 30 is 1,260 days. 1,260 days, a day for a year, 1,260 years, we will come to that later, is a period when the sanctuary will be trampled underfoot and God's people as well. Now who are these two witnesses that will stand up for what God has to say? Well, these are the two olive trees. And the two candlesticks, the lights, standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, let's take note of this, if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemy. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Don't mess with these olive trees. Don't mess with these two candlesticks. Well, it would be interesting to know who they are. Isn't that so? Well, let's first have a look at this prophetic time period. So there's a key to the year-day principle, and we find it as the period of reign of the little horned power in Daniel chapter 7, where it says, They shall be given into his hand, that's the saints of the Most High, for a time, times, and the dividing of times, that is three and a half prophetic years, or 42 months, or 1,260 days. We'll see the parallels in a moment. And calculating the length of this prophetic period is greatly simplified if we note these simple points. A time was a year. Some of the newer translations will just say three and a half years. That's 360 days. You can see Daniel chapter 4, 16 and 11, 13 margin in the uh, authorized version of the Bible, the King James. Prophetic time or year had 360 days. A day means a year or a time means a year in Bible prophecy. You'll find that in the authorized version. So we add it up and it comes to 1,260 days. And you can look up Numbers 14, 34 and Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6, where it says, I have appointed thee each day for a year. Proof of the pudding is always in the eating. So these are then actually 1,260 literal years. Now, here are some other regions where you will find these texts. Daniel uses the the terminology in chapter 12, verse 7, a time, times, and a half. Revelation 11, 2, 40 and 2 months. Revelation 11, 3, 1260 days. Revelation 12, 6, 1260 days. Revelation 12, 14, time, times, and half a time. Revelation 13, 5, 40 and 2 months, all referring to the same time period. I'll show them to you again in a little while. Now, ten kingdoms of Rome 
uh, that, that emanated from Rome were established in AD 476. And in Daniel it says that this power that would control or have control over God's people would arise after the establishment of the ten kingdoms. In other words, after Western Rome was divided into ten. Well, this period is very interesting because after this period, in AD 538, the papal rule commenced according to the Justinian decree which said that the papacy would be the corrector of heretics and that he would be the head of all the churches. So you had a church state scenario. Now if you add to that date 1260 years you get to an interesting date 1798. Let's look at these time periods again. In Daniel 7.25, a time, times, and the dividing of times. Daniel 12.7, a time, times, and a half. Revelation 11.2, 40 and two months. Revelation 11.3, 1260 days. Revelation 12.6, 1260 days. Revelation 12.14, time, times, and half a time. Revelation 13.5, 40 and two months. Do you think God is serious about telling you about this time period? It seems like it, eh? He wants us to know something about this time period. And we can find out from the Bible that they mean the same thing through Hebrew parallelism. For example, in the book of Revelation, it will say, a woman, a wilderness, 1,260 days. In another verse, it will say, a woman, a wilderness, 42 months. In another place it will say three and a half years. And so you can see that they apply to the same thing. A very, very important prophecy. Now, in 1798, something very interesting happened. Berthier, the French general, marched into Rome under orders of Napoleon, and he arrested the Pope and declared the papacy at an end. Declared it at an end. Now, it is important to note that the papacy was a political entity. And if you take the definition of Daniel chapter 7, that a political entity is called a beast, power, the kingdoms you saw, the four beasts or four kingdoms which shall arise upon the earth, then if you end that political power, well then that beast dies. Now it's interesting that it, to this particular power there's another interesting verse in Revelation which says it seemed to have a mortal wound but the mortal wound was healed. In other words it dies but it comes back. And this power was reinstated as a political entity in 1929 when Mussolini granted the Papal States and political autonomy to the Vatican again. So there was a beast a political, religio-political entity. It received a mortal wound over here, and yet it rose and received it back again. And then there are some interesting things in the book of Revelation about this. So let's look at this mortal wound. On the 21st of February, 1798, Pope Pius VI was dethroned by Napoleon. His ring was torn off from his finger. That is the symbol of his power. And he died in exile, so there was a mortal wound. By December 1804, Pope Pius witnessed uh, Napoleon crown himself emperor. Here was now a pope, pope without a political entity to rule. It had been taken away. 1808, Napoleon took the Vatican States, so he confiscated the entire state of the Vatican. 1848, Massini attacked Rome. And Pope Pius IX is exiled, he's restored in 1850, but he had lost all the papal states. So there was now no longer a political entity. There was a mortal wound. And the timing, amazing. 538, he ascends the throne under the protection of the Eastern Roman Empire, under the emperor himself, and assumes the authority of the Justinian decree. 1,260 prophetic days later, 
the political power comes to an end. Interesting. Immediately, Napoleon reinstated religious freedom in 1806, on the 30th of May, and so we had a power that ruled over God's people for a period of time, politically, dictating to other political forces what they should do with dissenters. You see, Rome never put anyone to death. Never. The Inquisition was run by the Jesuits and uh, later by the Dominicans, but the Jesuits were the original inquisitors. They would find someone guilty and hand him over to the state who put him to death. That's how it worked. Now, who are these two witnesses that witnessed in sackcloth during this time period? My two witnesses, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. By the way, did the Roman church suppress the scriptures during its period of reign, yes or no? Yes. I was a Catholic. It was a mortal sin to read the Bible. It was a mortal sin. Later on, after 1962, that was rescinded and changed, and we'll come to why. Very interesting stuff in a subsequent lecture. So who are these two witnesses? Could they perhaps be the scriptures? The Old and the New Testament? Is it possible? Well, let's go to Zechariah and see if we can find an answer. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1. And the angel that talked with me came again and walked me, waked me as a man that is waked out of his sleep. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick. Now here you have a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees. There we have the same symbols, so Revelation draws on the symbolism in Zechariah here. And remember that the power that ruled for 1,260 years as a political entity, having political muscle over everyone that dissented as a heretic, for example, is involved. So we'll look at Zechariah and see if we can find some other images here that might be interesting. So we find the candlesticks that are mentioned in Revelation. We also find the two olive trees that are mentioned in Revelation. By it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. Verse 4, So I answered and spoke to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Well, that's what we're just asking. So maybe we can get an answer. And the angel that talked with me answered and said to me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Just like we would say. What are they? And then he answered and spoke unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord. Unto Zerubbabel, saying. And then he says, Whatever it is there is to say. So what are these olive trees and the candlesticks? The word of God. The word of God. So this word of God was prophesying in sackcloth, in other words, suppressed, for 1,260 days. You know, when the Reformation started printing the Bible, they started using the Gutenberg press, and they just marched in there, and they smashed it. And they burnt every Bible that was being printed. And they tried to destroy it with every means at their disposal, without much success. Well, later on, they wrote their counter version, which is known as the Jesuit Bible. We'll come to that later. Verse 11, Then answered I and said unto him, And what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again, and I said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No. My Lord, then he said, these are the two anointed ones. Anointed with power from God. In other words, the whole, through the Holy Spirit, this message of God, this word of God, was to be preached to the world, whether suppressed or not, that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. And then I turned, and I lifted up my eyes, and I looked... 
Now what is he going to see? He's going to see what it's all about. A flying roll. Now what's a flying roll? That's a scroll. That's the Word of God was in a scroll. So he sees the Word of God flying through the air. What's that a symbol of? Taking the message to the world. So this is what it's all about. It's about the Word of God. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is, and he gives the length and cubits. And he said unto me, This is the curse that goes forth over the whole earth, for every one that stealeth shall be cut off. These are the warnings of God. As on this side, according to it, and every one that sweareth shall be cut off on that side, according to it. I will bring it forth, says the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief, and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name, and it shall remain in the midst of his house, and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. Okay. So the word of God will convict whether it's suppressed or not. Is that right? Basically what it says. Let's read on, because Zechariah gets interesting. Then the angel that talked with me went forth. Remember, Revelation 11 is quoting from Zechariah, from these very verses. And we can get more information. What was that I said in the beginning? To the law and to the testimony. So now we're digging in the testimony to see what other prophets had said that would be in harmony with what's going on over here. Lift up now thy eyes and see this that goes forth. And I said, what is this? And he said, this is an ephah. Wow, now it gets interesting. That goes forth. Now what is an ephah? An ephah was a measure. It was a standard measure wherein you would measure flour, for example. Now, in the book of Revelation, wasn't there some measuring going on, yes or no? Aha! So here we have another measuring going on. We have the standard of measurement. Obviously, the standard for whatever is right and what is wrong. But here is an interesting standard that has set itself up. What is this? And I said, this is an ephah that goes forth. And he said, moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. This standard is what you will see throughout the earth. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. You see, the ephah had a lid on it, a heavy lid. And uh, this Lid here was a heavy lid. It was made of lead. So he lifted up this lead, lid, and he looked inside the ephah, which is the standard of measurement. And what does he see inside? A woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. Oh, that's interesting. What's a woman in the Bible? It's a church. It's a church. So there is an apostate church on this earth, and there is a righteous church on this earth. And in this one, there sits a woman. So there is a standard, an ephah, that is being set up by a church. Is that logical? That sits in the midst of the ephah, and he said, this is wickedness. So this is contrary to what the scroll had been saying. The scroll in the beginning had said, I will convict you by my word. If you steal, you will know about it. If you do this, that, and the other, my word will convict you. But here is another standard on earth, and it is controlled by a different church, and it's a wicked one. It says it's wickedness. And he cast it in the midst of the earth, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. So this woman was revealed for a time, and then the lid was put back. Oops. Now that's interesting. Did the Reformation reveal a standard that was not biblical, yes or no? Sure did. And the lid was lifted up and everybody could see it. What did the Reformation call Rome? Blatantly said, Antichrist. And then, closed. What does the Reformation say today? Publicly, officially, by all their synods. What did the Lutheran Synod decide? 1994, I think, was the date, if I'm correct. She may no longer be called Antichrist. Calvinists decided the same. All of them decided the same thing. So, 
the lid goes back on. Then lifted up mine eyes and looked and beheld there came two women. And the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork. Oh, that's bad news. That's bad news. Because you see, the stork is an unclean bird. And a bird, in the Bible here, is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So here are two groups which will now, through the workings of a false spirit, lift up this standard with the other woman in it, between heaven and earth, and they said to the angel that talked with me, Whether do these bear the ephah, the standard? And he said to me, To build it a house in the land of Shinar. That's Babylon. And it shall be established and set there upon her own base. Wow. What Zechariah is saying is that another standard will reign on this earth. The standard will be set by a church. Everybody will have a knowledge that it was wickedness, it was revealed, but the wickedness is being covered up. And then two powerful church groups, the Bible calls them the dragon and the false prophet powers, will come and lift up this standard and say, there it is. And the Babylonian Empire will be reborn in spiritual sense on this earth with a standard that replaces God's standard. Does that make sense? Scary. Is it going to happen? Well, let's see what the rest of Revelation has to say on the issue. The Word of God. Now we've had a background from the place in the Bible where Revelation takes its imagery and tells us what's going on. The Word of God. Revelation 11.6 These have power to shut heaven that it rain not. Does the word of God have power to do that? Absolutely. Did Elijah do it? Elijah prayed under the instigation of God and said it will not rain three and a half years, and it didn't rain three and a half years. Interesting that this prophetic power reigns three and a half prophetic years. No rain. What does that mean spiritually? A barrenness for the word of God. So they made war against the word of God, not in the days of their prophecy. So there was spiritual darkness, we've dealt with that already, and have power of the waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Wow. Bad news. If you take the word of God away, you're in trouble. And when they shall have finished their testimony in sackcloth, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pits shall make war against them. Now, when will they have finished their testimony in sackcloth? After the 1,260 days. Well, if that prophecy is correct, then that brings us to about 1798. And in that time period, a power will start emerging on earth which will make it its business to destroy the Word of God. Interesting. So after 1798, a power will emerge that will make it its business to destroy the Word of God. And this beast descendeth out of the bottomless pit. Now, who was in the bottomless pit before? Well, the star that fell from heaven made smoke come out of the bottomless pit, his false doctrines wafting across the earth, and now it is being established to the point of authority. So this is Satan's kingdom growing on the earth. But remember, God is just watching it and permitting it and telling you about it. And he shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So there must be something happening where the word of God is officially rejected. But this is a greater involvement. There is going to be the rise of a kingdom that officially wants to obliterate the word of God. And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, our Lord was not crucified in Sodom, and he was not crucified in Egypt. 
So only in the form of his people can he be crucified. Now, is there perhaps a little typology that we could grab onto here? Is there anything that happened round about this time period, 1798, round about there, where there was an attack on words God, on the, on the word... That was a mix-up of words, I'll repeat that. <laughs> where there was an attack on the word of God, in a place where God's people had been sacrificed, if you like, killed, murdered, for the sake of their faith, so Christ being crucified again in the form of his people, is there a country that did that? Actually there is. Very interesting country. And that country was France. And uh, they did exactly this. They are enacting a little miniature. In uh, the book Great Controversy, there's a beautiful statement on this issue. Let's read it. The great city in whose streets the witnesses are slain and where their dead bodies lie is spiritually Egypt. Of all nations presented in the Bible, Egypt most boldly denied the existence of the living God and resisted his commands. No monarch ever ventured upon more open and high-handed rebellion against the authority of heaven than did the king of Egypt. When the message was brought to him by Moses in the name of the Lord, Pharaoh proudly answered, Who is Jehovah, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not Jehovah, neither will I let Israel go. This is open rebellion against the word of God. goes on to say, this is atheism then. And the nation represented by Egypt would give voice to the similar denial of claims of the living God and would manifest a like spirit of unbelief and defiance. The great city is also compared spiritually to Sodom. The corruption of Sodom in breaking the law of God was especially manifested in licentiousness. In other words, you know, sexual depravity, if you like. And this sin was also to be preeminent characteristic of the nation that should fulfill the specification of the scripture. Now, I can go along with that. That's pretty fascinating stuff. Where also our Lord was crucified, this specification of the prophecy was also fulfilled by France. I agree with that. In no land had the spirit of enmity against Christ been more strikingly displayed. In no country had the truth encountered more bitter and cruel opposition in the persecution which France had visited upon the confessors of the gospel. She had crucified Christ in the person of his disciples. I concur with this. I would like to go even further and say that France is just the very beginning, the kernel of the rise of the kingdom of Lucifer. And I will prove that as we go along with help from many quotes. And we will see what was set up there, which is going to rule the whole world today. And it affects you and me directly. This is not just history. This is history in application. This is the famous Jacobin hat that was worn by the French revolutionaries. They wore the Jacobin hat. Now what the Jacobin hat means, I will be dealing with in a later lecture. Actually, it's the hat of Mitra. It's Mitraism, sun worship. But never mind. We'll come to that later. Revelation 11.7 And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them. Now, what happened in France is the forerunner, take note, what happened in France is the forerunner of what will happen in the entire world. Scary. And shall overcome them and kill them. Did France, after the French Revolution, make war against the word of God? Revelation 11.9 And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half. Well, we're another prophetic time. Three and a half days would be three and a half years. And shall not suffer their dead bodies to put in the graves. Well, from November 10, 1793 to June 1797, they did that. They banned the Bible. Officially, by government decree, they banned the Bible. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them. 
the two witnesses, the Old and the New Testament, make merry, shall send gifts to one another. Did the French do that? Yes, they actually did that. Because these two prophets, the Bible, had tormented them that dwelt on the earth. In actual fact, they only believed that this Bible had tormented them, the people, but somebody else actually believed that this Bible was a tormenting power. And I will show you tonight who that power is that made war against the Bible. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Did it destroy the Bible? No. After this event, which was just the beginning of this great attack on the Word of God, Power came into the Word of God and the Bibles went all over the world. All the great Bible societies were started after this day and the Bible was put into every hand that wanted it in the whole world. This infuriated the beast from the bottomless pit to such an extent that it changed its tactics of war. And we'll be dealing with that in two lectures called The Battle of the Bibles and changing the word. Don't miss those lectures. They're coming up and they are powerful. If you're angry with me tonight, come back anyway, okay? Even if you're angry, it's okay. You can be angry with me, but come anyway. So this word of God stood up and preached with power hereafter, but the war wasn't over, it just began. They heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the enemy, I'll tell you, hates the word of God. And the same hour, there was a great earthquake. And a tenth part of the city fell. Obviously referring to this spiritual city, Babylon, if you like, was shaken by this resurgence of power in the word of God. And so Satan redoubled his efforts to crunch it again thereafter. And in the earthquake was slain of men 7,000. Again, that is a symbolic number. And the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Notice the second woe is past. And behold, the third woe cometh quickly. A woe is something that makes it impossible for the people to find truth. The first woe was the destruction physically of the original Christian areas through powers that were against Christ. This woe is now a spiritually darkening of all knowledge pertaining to God by this power who makes war on the word of God. What happened in the French Revolution? Let's just see how it fulfilled these prophecies. This was the storming of the Bastille. And of course, at this very event, the whole political structure in the world changed. Whereas before you had monarchs ruling, now you have democracies. And democracies are going to rule everywhere. And that sounds very good. And we will see exactly what is behind all of these things later. So, Louis XVI, well... He lost his head, literally. And his head was held up before a cheering crowd as he went to the guillotine. And his wife, Marie Antoinette, did they have mercy on her? No, her head was put on a stake and held up to a cheering crowd. And then they took a prostitute, excuse the picture, but this is what they actually did with open breasts, and they called her Liberty. They made her a goddess, Liberty Leading. Now we read again what happened here in the book Great Controversy tells it to us quite beautifully. When the goddess was brought into the convention, the orator took her by the hand. Turning to the assembly, he said, Mortals, cease to tremble before the powerless thunders of a god whom your fears have created. Wow, this is a public assembly. Henceforth hath knowledge no divinity but reason. Can you imagine that? I offer you its noblest and purest image. If you must have idols, 
sacrifice only to such as this, fall before the august senate of freedom, veil of reason. So here was a power that had taken away the word of God and replaced it with the goddess of reason. But fortunately Jesus told us ahead of time that it would happen. And this means that uh, this goddess of reason takes the place of Jesus Christ only in appearance. The goddess, after being embraced by the president, was mounted on a magnificent car and conducted amidst an immense crowd to the cathedral of Notre Dame. So it was made official to take the place of the deity. Then she was elevated on the high altar and received the adoration of all present. So the government adored this lady. This is how it was done. She was taken through the streets. She was put onto a cart. She had a sun symbol and it said, Goddess of Reason over there. And she was enthroned in Notre Dame. And that which they believed Christianity had stood for was swept away by the legislature. And the Old Testament and the New Testament were burnt, and all religious books were burnt on a funeral pyre, and a new law replaced God's law. Can we replace God's law? I don't think so. That scroll that flies through heaven, the word of God, condemns us of right and of wrong, measures us according to its standard, irrespective of whether another institute raises up another standard, right or wrong. Yes? And so, tonight we will see how this battle continued. How one standard was laid aside, and how mankind adopted another standard. And may God help us to choose between standards. We continue the story. What happens when you replace God's standard with human standards? Human standards are made to look good, but obviously they have their problems. Well, during the French Revolution, a new standard for mankind evolved. And this standard was termed the Manifesto of Human Rights. Now isn't it fascinating that the French published their first Manifesto of Human Rights in this form? Isn't that fascinating? As two tablets of stone, what does that actually represent? The law of God. Here was man putting down another law. This is fascinating stuff. Oh, there's so much symbolism in this. It's way too big to deal with it with this tiny slide, I will put it up in another lecture in all its glorious detail and show you the symbolism behind it. I'll just mention just one. This year, a bundle of rods. A bundle of rods. Uh, this one over there, a serpent with its tail in its mouth. That one over there, the all-seeing eye in a triangle. Interesting symbolism. This one's fascinating. A bundle of rods, what does that mean? Those were fasciae, fasciae. You see, the Roman uh, proconsul, he took a bundle of rods, fasciae, and he took them upon the mount, and if he was accepted as the leader of all, he put a wreath around it. And he was all-powerful and in command. All control through the power of one man. It's called fascism. Fasciae fascism. If you think of Adolf Hitler, fascism. If you think of Mussolini, all power in one man. He was called the Führer. Is that right? Okay. And that is the system of control. Now, human rights, what has that got to do with fascism? Isn't that kind of interesting? I would say it's kind of interesting. But we'll, we'll leave it for another lecture. The first charter of, human, of rights uh, to nations was actually declared by Cyrus the Great. 
In the Persian culture, there was this great uh, fundamental principle, good thoughts, good words, good deeds, Cyrus the Great. Good thoughts, good words, good deeds. And his uh, manifest went like this, when my soldiers in great numbers peacefully entered Babylon, I did not allow anyone to terrorize the people. I kept in view the needs of people and all its sanctuaries to promote their well-being, freed all the slaves. Isn't it interesting that Napoleon freed all the slavery and he ended religious suppression and all these things? I put an end to their misfortune and slavery. That was quite a good manifest. And I mean, human rights look pretty good. We read on in the great controversy, century after century, the blood of saints had been shed. She talks about the Valdenses, the Albigenses, and she talks about the Protestants who were slaughtered, and much of it by the power of France. This is the Inquisition and the tools of the Inquisition, the axe that chopped off the head, then uh, instruments of terrible torture, and they were mainly tortured for heresy. Now, what's the definition of heresy? Let's look in article heresy, page 440. Greek heresis, choice. Deciding for oneself what one shall believe and practice. That's heresy. So deciding for yourself was, in this time period of 1,260 days, was an act of heresy, was a sin punishable by death. That's pretty sad, isn't it? So taking away the conscience of man, setting up a power. Now, here we're going to have some very interesting things happening. These were some of the instruments they used. These were, for example, tongs that opened up and you put hot coals in them, and then you sort of modified the person who you were interrogating with these hot coals. These here are ankle guards or ankle clamps and you'll notice the pins in them that when they were screwed tight they went right into the bone. I mean these people were pretty serious about what they did. This particular instrument was still used by General Franco in the 1970s. This is a pretty mean instrument. This is one where they put it around your neck and then they start screwing that screw in there. Not a very nice thing to do. Stocks of course, thumb screws, this instrument was particularly nasty. They would hoist you up with your hands tied behind your back on a rope until you hang upside down in the air. And then they would tie this huge stone to your feet and throw it off a shelf. And it would go and tear your arms out of their sockets. These are pretty terrible things that they did in the Inquisition. And I know one needn't talk about these things, but the cruelty of the system needs to be known. Revelation 12, 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. It's just to give us an idea what those poor Christians who stood for the word of God went through sometimes because they chose to believe it. It's pretty horrendous, isn't it? Pretty horrendous. And these are some of the stakes that uh, representations of the Inquisition where people died in their thousands, in their hundreds and thousands, no, in their millions. Because of heresas, making a choice. This is the Huguenot, French Huguenot monument in southern Africa. Many of the Huguenots of France fled and they erected this monument, this representing the Trinity, and here's a woman standing on the earth representing the bride of God. There she sits on the earth. She went down to Africa from Europe, and in her one hand she has the Bible over there, and in the other hand a chain. She broke the chain which bound her to Rome and fled to the far-off distant lands, to Africa, where she is now being slaughtered again, but that's another story, and fled to America and far-off lands to get away 
from the persecuting power of the 1260 days. Great Controversy says, blackest in the black catalogue of crime, most horrible amongst the fiendish deeds of all dreadful centuries, was St. Bartholomew Massacre. Wow. The King of France, urged on by Romish priests and prelates, lent his sanction to the dreadful work. A bell was placed. In the middle of the night, this bell was tolled, and then the slaughter began, and 50,000 Protestants were murdered in one night. By deception. They'd said to them, let's work together in future. Let's not fight anymore about all these things. And the Protestants thought, oh, wonderful. A kind word from Rome. We can relax. We can work together. And they went into an ecumenism. But meantime, there was a plot. And one night the bell tolled. And the unsuspecting, unguarded, died in one night. Well, the guns of the castle of St. Angelo gave forth joyous salute. In Rome, the, the bells rung in joy. Pope Gregory, attended by his cardinals and priests, led the magnificent procession to the church of St. Louis, where the cardinal of Lorraine chanted a Te Deum. They were so pleased that in one night they had slaughtered the French Huguenots. And the Pope had a medal struck. Here it is. A medal with his name on the one side and on the other side the word Ugonotorum Strages, which means slaughter of the Huguenots. They rejoiced. Isn't this a terrible thing that happened? Deuteronomy 11.16 Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived, deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you and be shut up the heaven that there be no rain and that the land yield not her fruit and lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. So if you turn away from the word of God and you take the law of God away, then there will be dryness, barrenness. Revelation 11.7 and when they shall have finished their testimony, this word of God, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit will make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Now, this over here, as I have said before, was a Jacobin hat. Now, what was a Jacobin hat? And who controlled the Jacobin? Well, the founder of the Jacobins was a man by the name of Adam Weishaupt. Now, who was Adam Weishaupt? He was a Jesuit professor of canon law. Isn't that interesting? So, the one who actually organized the French Revolution, if you like, was a Jesuit. And he was the father of Jacobinism. He was also the founder of the Illuminati. So a Jesuit founded the Illuminati and a Jesuit ran Jacobinism, which was responsible for the French Revolution. Here is Ingolstadt University, where he was professor. It's interesting that after the French Revolution, the papacy had received a mortal wound and became insignificant in the eyes of men. But in 1929, the smallest state in the world was once again established. So here was something that had received a wound, and now it rose again. So in 1929, Gaspari signed the Lateran Treaty, and the Vatican States came back into existence. And the San Francisco Chronicle said, Mussolini and Gaspari sign historic Roman pact. The Roman question tonight was a thing of the past and the Vatican was at peace with Italy in affixing the autographs to the memorable document Healing the Wound. It's like they're quoting from the Bible. Extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. Fascinating story. So a power seemed to have a mortal wound and then rose again. Now, it's interesting that it only seemed to have a mortal wound. Deception is something that is 
inexplicable sometimes. Let me show you some of the later popes. Here is Anthony Sayer. He was the first Grand Master of Freemasonry in the London Lodge, founded in 1717. Remember, this is the forerunner time period uh, leading up to this whole French Revolution time. And these uh, Freemasons stand like this with their hands on their stomachs with their finger pointing up. Well, the Pope himself, this is a picture of Pope Pius XII, he had a, a stamp printed which is square and has Masonic symbolism on it where he stands on it like this as well. It's interesting that the Vatican banned Freemasonry. But it's interesting too that if you want something not to be pinned to you, then you ban it and practice it in secret. But at the Vatican itself, the lodges abounded and every cardinal was a member. Interesting. Even while it was banned. Revelation chapter 9 Remember, it told us, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven onto the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. So the light that Jesus gives will be darkened because of the smoke. That's where it started. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 3, we have another beast. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns upon his heads. So, in Revelation chapter 9, we have the smoke coming out. In Revelation chapter 11, this beast comes out of the same bottomless pit. So, it grows this darkness into an established kingdom starts to grow. The other powers in Revelation are this dragon with the seven heads, with the crowns upon his head. We are told who he is. We're told it's Satan, who represents all the kingdoms of the earth, apparently. And we are told in Revelation 12, 9, that he is the one who was cast out, that he is the devil, and that he deceives the whole world. All right? And that he makes war with the woman in white, which is the other good church on earth that represents the Word of God. There are other beasts in the book of Revelation. There's the lion with the two wings, which is an image from the book of Daniel. In Revelation 13, we have a beast that has the mouth of a lion. Then there is this leopard-like beast in Revelation 13. These attributes are also found. There is a bear in Daniel 7. These attributes are also found in the beast of Revelation 13. And then there's a terrible beast that you don't know what, really what it looks like, so it's just an artist's impression. And it has ten horns, and that you also find in Revelation 13. So these beasts are all very interesting, but they are represented as coming out of the sea. Okay. Then in Revelation 13, all the attributes of Daniel 7 are in this one conglomerate beast that arises out of the sea. We'll deal with them in detail. Revelation 13 also has a beast out of the earth. And that looks like, maybe like this, I don't know what it looked like. And in Revelation chapter 17, you have another beast with a woman riding on it. Now let's read that, 17.3. So he carried him away, away in the spirit in the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, it's against God, having seven heads and ten horns. And verse 8, The beast that thou sawest was, is not, shall ascend out of where? Bottomless pits, and go into perdition. Aha! That's interesting. Which other beast came out of the bottomless pit? The one in Revelation 11, right? That makes war on God's people. Now is there a link here? Probably. And who controls this beast that comes from this bottomless pit? Who rides it? A woman. A church rides it. Is it possible, you think, that the political systems on this earth are being run by a woman and we don't really know it because she has concealed herself in mystery, in secrecy. 
and you don't really see it, you don't know it, but it's actually happened, do you think it's possible? Do you think that this power, this church, might have used its agents to pretend to kill her when actually they control the world through its agencies, through the secret societies of the world, which was started by none other than Weishaupt, who was a what? A Jesuit. Is it possible? Illuminism? What is Illuminism? Where does it lead us? Is it possible that this war against the Word and those that represent the Word, the Church, are going to come into conflict with this new political entity that has a new standard which is called human rights? Do you think it's possible? Yeah, do you think so? Wow. You know, there is one author who 150 years ago wrote on these issues, and I'm going to quote this author now, but the point is, not whether this is right or whether it's wrong, it's just what was perceived at that stage, and compared to what the occult world said at exactly the same time, we will be doing this, we will be comparing what this source said with what the occultists themselves said at exactly the same time period, and we will see something fascinating. So if you will bear with me, without further identification, I would like to read some of these things that were seen to be correct at that stage, 150 years ago, when all these things were happening. You know, the French Revolution and all these things. Variety, by a variety of images, the Lord Jesus represented to John, that's now in the Revelation, the wicked character and seductive influence of those who have been distinguished for the persecution of God's people. God's representation of the detestable works of the inhabitants of the ruling powers of the world who bind themselves into secret societies and confederacies, not honoring the law of God, should enable the people who have the light of truth to keep clear of these evils. Hmm. So, 150 years ago already they perceived that, wow, secret societies were going to play an important role. So to John, the wicked character of these seductive influences was shown by those who distinguish themselves for the persecution of God's people. Now who are they? This terrible picture drawn by John is to show how completely the powers of earth will give themselves over to evil and should show that those who have received the truth, how dangerous it is to link up with secret societies or to join them. This is fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. The ruling powers of the world who bind themselves in secret societies and confederacies, and they will not keep the commandments of God. They will have another standard. Here is a text then quoted by the prophet Isaiah, which I read to you, Isaiah, in chapter 8, verse 9 to 13, says, Associate yourselves, O ye people, and you shall be broken in pieces. In other words, make these confederacies behind the scenes. Come on, plan together as a world to overcome truth. O ye people, and you shall be broken. Give ear, and you of ye of far countries, gird yourselves, and you shall be broken. Gird yourselves, and you shall be broken. Take counsel together, it shall come to naught. Speak the word, it shall not stand. For God is with us. These people are saying, God is with us. We're doing the right thing. For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of the people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. Aha! So Isaiah is predicting that the world will confederate and say, the Lord is in this, we're working together as a group, and uh, we're doing the right thing, and this is the best thing to do. But they're leaving God out of it, and it will not work. Then, this writer applies this and says, there are those who question whether it's right for Christians to belong to Freemasons and other secret societies. Let all such consider the scriptures just quoted. If we are Christians at all, we must be Christians everywhere. And must consider and heed the counsel given to make us Christians according to the standard of God's word. That's fascinating. 
So isn't it important that we have a look at what do the Freemasons actually teach? Or maybe even more interesting, who founded the Freemasons? Who controls them? What do they teach? Do they actually preach against Jesus and the Word of God? Do they make war on the Word of God, yes or no? These are questions we need to ask ourselves. The unchristlikeness of the whole confederacy will be seen in the secret societies because they serve gods as senseless and powerless to bless as the gods of the Hindus. Interesting. Those who stand under the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel cannot be united with Freemasons or any other secret organization. Christ is not divided. I agree with that. None can be bound up with them and be free men before gods. Wow, interesting. Christians must sever every tie that bind them to the secret orders that are not under the control of God. We cannot belong to secret societies. This was written 150 years ago. And then, one thing I do know, those who remain in connection with them will be burned up with the bundles of tears. Interesting statements. Satanic agencies are in every city busily organizing into parties those opposed to the law of God. We cannot afford to be off our guard. And then, one of the plans of the secret societies is to form gigantic monopolies. Gigantic monopolies will be formed. A few men will combine to grasp all the means to be obtained in certain lines of business. Do we see that today, by the way? Do we see gigantic monopolies being formed, forcing the little man right out of industry so that you will be subjected to their power? Yes or no? And if you do not do their bidding, you will not be able to prosper. Do we see mega mergers? Yes or no? You cannot open a newspaper today without reading about mega mergers, right or wrong. It sounds good, but do you know that your freedom is being eroded piece by piece until you are nothing better than a slave? And if you should dare open your mouth, well, We'll take your job away and your industry and you will not be able to buy or sell. Trade unions will be one of the agencies that will bring upon this earth a time of trouble such as not been since the world began. People don't believe that. I believe it. I have had the unfortunate experience of standing on the other side of trade unions when they go berserk. Have you ever seen that? It's kind of scary. In Africa, where I live, trade unions are very powerful. And trade union sounds like a good thing. And it's, of course, guaranteed by human rights to have trade unions because you are allowed to fight for your rights. But think about it. If the cake is X big, and I fight for a bigger slice, what does that do to the slice of my neighbor? It makes his slice smaller, right or wrong. Am I loving my neighbor as myself when I make his slice smaller so that mine can become bigger, yes or no? I don't think so. And what if it comes to the point to where you do not want to slice up the slice? Well, then you just take your slice. I've stood on the other side of this. I've had my ribs broken by trade unionists. They were using the universities to bring their points across to governments. They declared a boycott of all university classes. And students were deprived of their education. That means that the student can miss a whole year having paid for his tuition and then lose everything. So the university decreed classes go on. So I was the professor. I said classes go on. And then the trade union caught us with a class in progress. And I went and stood in front of the doors and I said, sorry, you cannot go in here. It's I who gave permission to the students to be taught in there. I'm responsible, not them. And then they started crushing me and they broke my ribs. And the riot police were all around and they, did they lift a finger? No. I have proof of this. I was on the front page of every newspaper in that country. And uh, nothing happened. 
The students didn't get their way. They then left, fortunately, for some reason they left. Maybe there is power in the power of prayer. They went to another place and they smashed everything, including the poor students, beat them up terribly. My students escaped that day by the grace of God. I've stood in a building where trade unions were negotiating for something that was not in the power of those who they were negotiating with to give. And so they started rhythmically smashing against the building, as only Africans can do, and this whole glass building exploded. Unbelievable. It came down like a shower of glass. And uh, terrible things. The destruction that you see. One of the agencies to bring about a time of trouble. The labor unions are not from God. Those who bind themselves together with secret societies stay away from them. This was written many years ago. In Revelation chapter 11 verse 15, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God in the, on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. So the good news is that in spite of this power that starts off first in Revelation chapter 9 opening up the pits of hell to bring about doctrines in the world which darken the light and bring darkness over the earth grows eventually through history by the time we get to the time of the French Revolution the pits of hell are opened up again and a power arises which is to become a universal political power which will be controlled by a woman, by a church, which will replace the word of God and substitute it with its own standard, its own effa. Does that make sense? And it looks good on paper, but actually violates every principle of the Word of God. Every principle of the Ten Commandments is violated. And it is difficult to see because it looks so good. But as we continue with the lectures, you will see that this is really the case. If you take just the first commandment which it says, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods beside me. Well, there were countries that honored that or whatever. If you're going to have a universal free-for-all with everybody accepted, that would have to go. In fact, it would have to then say, you will have all other gods besides me, right or wrong. You will have to tolerate idolatry or else you're in trouble. When it comes to blasphemy, isn't it fascinating that when you switch on the television, only one God is blasphemed? Have you noticed that? Only one God is blasphemed, none of the others. This I always find very fascinating. I want to write to the Human Rights Commission and say, you know, in the interest of fairness and equality, should not all gods be equally blasphemed? Couldn't you spread it around a little bit in the interest of fairness? I wonder how they would react. I wonder how the Muslim world would react <laughs> if that was done, that, was do that is being done to Jesus Christ on the television every single day. I wonder how they would react if the same was done in terms of their religion or the Buddhist religion or the Hindu religion or any other religion on the face of the earth if we wanted equality of everyone. What about the fifth commandment? Honor your father and your mother. No, the children today have to be re-educated to other standards, to become citizens of the world, which means that they must stop honoring their father and mother and start honoring the system. Did they do that in communism? What did they do in communism when the children wanted to cling to the norms of the parents? What did they do to them? They took them away and re-educated them. 
they taught them not to honor their father and their mother. Isn't that sad? Thou shalt not kill. Wow. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not bring false testimony. Are these things being tolerated? Of course. Jesus will one day invite everyone into his kingdom. In his kingdom there will be righteousness and truth and there will be no more lie. The standards will be the standards that he has set and that apply to everything. And the nations were angry. And thy wrath is come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldst give reward unto the servants, the prophets, and to the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldst destroy them which destroy the earth. Isn't that interesting? And the temple of God was opened in heaven. We're in Revelation chapter 11. And there was seen in his temple the Ark of the Testament. Where is Jesus? In which chamber? In the Most Holy. Wow! We have moved from a time of ministration in the first chamber to ministration in the second chamber, which is judgment. And the Ark of the Testimony, the Ten Commandments of the universal standard of what is right and what is wrong. There's no doubt about that. And we see that testimony. And this means time is up. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. This is the story of the last plague on earth. And the kingdom of God becomes the kingdom of earth as well. So Jesus, the great high priest, is seen in front of the Ark of the Testimony. That is the true standard. Not the ephah controlled by a woman. And no matter how many stalk like birds, unclean spirits, elevate the standard for the world to accept it's contrary to the word of God. As we saw up to now, this church is defined, unfortunately. It's the one that rules for 1,260 days. It is the church of the Middle Ages. It is the Roman church. And I cannot change it. I was one myself. And I'm so grateful for the Word of God for having shown me these things. And behind it all, behind this French Revolution and all of these, we see the agencies of this church. We see Jesuit agencies behind it all. And we've seen that secret societies, because everything is shrouded in mystery, will bring about the changes which will make none and void the Word of God. So in the next lectures, we're going to go behind the scenes and open up some facts to see if this really is so. But even if it is so, which I assume is so, Jesus is in control. And he's permitted us to see all these things. And he is the officiating high priest. He is the king of kings. He will come again in glory. And no matter how much darkness comes out of the bottomless pit, Jesus is in control. And there's nothing to fear. Cling to him and nobody will be lost. Thank you.